So my name's Adam. I am a senior editor at Diatribe. Does, that, does anyone in the room get Diatribe? Okay, a few people. So at Diatribe, our mission is to help people with diabetes by sharing great information and the newest things happening in diabetes. I write a column where I share tips and tricks and things that I've been using that are really helpful. And my full-time job is actually covering diabetes technology. So after this session, I'll do a breakout on specifically on diabetes technology. Can people in the back hear okay? All right. So a few years ago, I, I've been writing this column in Diatribe where I share what's been helpful for me, and my boss said, you should write a book that compiles all of the things you found helpful into one guide. And I thought, that is a terrible idea. <laughs> I write about diabetes my full-time job. I don't want to write a book about it. There's a ton of diabetes books out there. So uh, I did end up writing it, and people have found it really, really helpful. So everyone will get, every family will get a book after this session. They're out on the table out there. And I signed half of them. So if you didn't get a signed one, I can sign the other ones. And this talk will just be about some of the tips and tricks in the book. And uh, we'll just dive right in. So I was diagnosed with type 1 at age 12. This is the most awkward, <laughs> hilarious picture I could find around that time. And I think what's super interesting about that time is I'm the oldest of six kids. So I'm actually from Phoenix. And so some of my family is here in the audience. And that required me to be really responsible from a very young age. So I always took my insulin. I always counted my carbs. I always did what we were supposed to do. We always showed up for doctor's appointments. And I really struggled with diabetes for a long time. And I think it's really helpful to look back on that time and try to tease out why. So one of them was, this is what I was told as a teenager, manage your diabetes or else you're going to have long-term complications. No teenager is ever motivated by that. <laughs> Doesn't work. Second, this is what we were told. You can eat anything with diabetes as long as you take insulin for it. Was anyone told that? So I understand the reason to say this to someone who's young, but what you, when you tell someone that, it requires enormous diabetes effort and frustration and insulin dosing burden to actually keep in range blood sugars when you eat whatever you want. So when I was a teenager, that was a blank check for me to eat whatever I wanted. And that was why we, I had you know, an A1C in the eight to nine percent range for a very long time. And then the last was when I was diagnosed in 2001, CGM, continuous glucose monitoring, was not around. So I had three data points per day to learn, which is not a lot of data. So if you imagine, I draw this analogy, imagine driving a car across the country and you only get to look at where you're going out of the windshield three times a day. You wouldn't be able to stay on the road, right? So it's very hard to keep your blood sugar in range when you don't have a lot of data to make decisions. So there were three really important turning points in my life with diabetes. One was in college, I started taking nutrition classes, and there was this epiphany where I realized I actually can't eat whatever I want with diabetes and take insulin for it. It actually doesn't work that well. The second was that guy in the middle was my roommate in college, <laughs> which will definitely teach you something. <laughs> the third was I was at a diabetes conference. Uh, I started interning at Diatribe over summer, and I was at a diabetes conference, and there was a panel of people with diabetes talking about CGM. I'd never heard of CGM, didn't know what it was, and I was so utterly convinced by what these people had to say that I went to the lobby of the hotel, and this was in 2010, and I called up Dexcom from the lobby, and I got on the 7 Plus back then, which is just an incredible way to accelerate your learning curve, I think. And then last, since my full-time job is writing about diabetes at Diatribe and at a company called Close Concerns, I get to learn every day and test things and see what's new and, and apply that in my life. So what I'm really interested in and what the focus of this book is, is this slide. We all have the very few moments, but we have those moments where things seem to be going well. And you feel like you're on top of the world. And I call those bright spots. And what's much more common in diabetes are the face palm moments, which are the ones on the right. And I call those landmines. And I think it's really interesting to look at those moments and say, what was driving that? And what bright spots are, and this is one of my missions with this book, is these are not intuitive questions that most of us ask. What's going well in my diabetes that I should keep doing? What happens on my best days? When my blood sugar stays in range, like what did I actually do? And 
when I'm in a positive mood? Like, what drove that on that particular day? And then the important thing with bright spots is to say, how can I have more days like that, more moments like that, so that I increase those in my life? What we're all really good at is identifying diabetes landmines. These are the, the things that I shouldn't have eaten that explode into out of range blood sugars, right? We all know what those are. Those super challenging days where you feel like you're walking uphill in the snow, in the mud, and nothing seems to be working right. Where you're in that negative mood, you get the 258 on the meter and you're really frustrated at yourself and you can't explain why. And so these are important to an extent, but the key is to figure out what is driving them and then how can you build a system around yourself so that you have fewer landmines. And I'll talk a little bit about that in this talk. Another way to think about this is, imagine this is your 24-hour glucose levels over the course of a day. If I wanted to improve, where should I focus my efforts? There's, there's tons of opportunities here to improve, right? What all of us are really good at is identifying all of the mistakes and things that we're doing wrong that we should do less of. So there's plenty of those in this plot. You can see I ate something, went super high, took a rage bolus, then went way too low. <laughs> Then I rebounded and probably went high a few hours later. So I could think about the landmines. What did I eat in that one scenario that caused that? And maybe I could have that ha happen less often. But there's also some bright spots in this graph. And so here's a solid nine hour period where I stayed in the kind of 75 to 100 range. And what, what drove that? What allowed me to stay in range and keep my glucose flat? And if I wanted to have that happen tomorrow, what would I do? And so this book is about this idea, this dichotomy of bright spots and landmines and how we have more bright spots and reduce landmines. And uh, everyone, as I said, will get a book out here. But what's really cool about Diatribe is we actually published this book as uh, we self-published it. So it's available at that link as a free PDF. So anyone can get it for free. And if you want to donate to Diatribe, you can. And the book is priced at cost on Amazon. So I don't make a single dollar from any book that's ever sold because we want, as, cost is such a huge problem in diabetes. And so we want everyone to have access to great information. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I'll, I'm just going to share some of my favorite things in Bright Spots and Landmines. I'm going to actually focus the most on food because I, I noticed in the schedule that wasn't a big focus of the day. And I think it's, it's the first chapter in the book, I think, because it's the hardest part of living with diabetes. And it drives the most differences in blood sugar. So I'll, I'll share my food toolkit and then I'll, I'll go through mindset and then just a couple on exercise and sleep. But I, I really like this plot because it shows the difference between how I eat now which is a low carb, high fat diet, and how I ate when I was diagnosed with diabetes, which was a pretty low fat diet that I call normal carb. So on average, people with diabetes eat about 45% of their calories from carbs. So if you eat about 2,000 calories a day, that's about 200, 250 grams of carbs per day. Now I eat typically less than 100 per day. And I, I actually put my, I'm, I'm a big proponent of sharing my CGM data because I think it shows that this works. And this is what's really important to me. This is my, um, this is in the book. So this is my 90 day data over the, the 90 days before I finished writing the book. And I think it's really important to say like this requires less work than the way that I ate before. It's actually less work than the, eat whatever you want and take insulin for it approach, and it delivers better outcomes, which I think is incredibly remarkable. And I, I pulled this plot the other day. This is recent 90-day data. And you can see over October 8th of last year to January 5th of this year, I had zero values over 250, and zero under, basically 0 0.4 under 54, and 82% in target. And I don't carb count. I don't have to figure out complicated boluses. I don't have a lot of frustrating highs and lows because I've taken out a huge, the single biggest variable in type 1 diabetes, which is how many carbs you're eating. And people look at me and are like, okay, that's great. What kind of weird, crazy, health food, nut diet do you eat, you weirdo? <laughs> which is fair. And, um, it was funny. On New Year's, we went to, I went with my girlfriend to a, there was a, 
she was going to a dinner with her boss, and there were a bunch of colleagues around, and every, it was a pizza restaurant. So everyone at the table ordered pizza to share, and I ordered a salad, and everyone just started looking at me as like, who's this New Year's resolutions guy over here? <laughs> Um, so I'll, I'll say that I tend to eat different things, but I still find ways to eat pizza and waffles and rice and fajitas. I just choose different items when I do that, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But these are just some pictures of the kind of stuff I eat. So for people who are resistant to this idea, here's what I tell them. Just do this one meal a day. Do it at breakfast. Breakfast is the most important meal to get right for a ton of reasons. One is it sets you up for the entire rest of the day. So if you start high at breakfast, you will be more likely to be high the rest of the day. Most people with type 1 are insulin resistant in the morning, at least I certainly am, especially if I haven't gotten enough sleep. And then you stack caffeine on top of that, and you have a rocket ship with, without eating much. And then I'll show a slide at the end of the uh, presentation on that point. But So I really focus on eating a few carbs at breakfast, and uh, chia pudding is something that I am a big proponent of, and eating eggs is also one, and I'll, I'll talk about chia pudding in a second, but this is, this is the traditional breakfast. And you can see this is unsweetened plain Greek yogurt, berries, and an apple, which I think most nutritionists would look at that and say, well done, pat on the back. And you can see I took insulin 20 minutes before, I measured out every single carb, I went from 116 to 275 in an hour. This, keep in mind, this was insulin 20 minutes before. And then I crashed to 52, and then I probably ate too much, and then I probably went high again. So my approach is to just take out that whole high, and then the whole rest of the day improves because I've just pulled something out. So this is, um, I've eaten chia pudding probably 600 times. So I really know what this does to my blood sugar, and it is almost always it looks like that. This is taking one unit of insulin right when I start eating, and actually if you don't take insulin, it doesn't look too much different. Um, what's chia pudding? So it takes three minutes to make, it doesn't require cooking, and it costs about 60 cents a meal. And I, we made a geeky YouTube video for people who are interested, but what you do is you take a quarter cup of chia seeds, and a half cup of water and you mix it up. And what chia seeds, for people who've never heard of chia seeds or don't know what they are, they look like poppy seeds. And they're 80% fiber and all omega-3s. So it's a really solid choice. But when you mix it with water, it creates this cool gel. And it doesn't taste like anything, so you can put nuts on top, berries, things like that. But what I like about it is it's portable on the road, it's really fast, it doesn't require a microwave, it's vegan for people who are vegan or vegetarian. And a lot of people have told me it's changed their life, which is pretty high praise, I think. So if you haven't tried this, give it a shot. And um, I'm happy to talk, if you have tried it and it hasn't gone well, I'm happy to brainstorm with people. But lots of parents give their kids this, they'll put a couple chocolate chips in there, they'll put all kinds of different things so you can customize it however you like to eat. So of all the things I think in Bright Spots and Landmines, chia pudding is the one that I think has blown the most people away in terms of immediate sustained impact on their life. So give it a shot. Um, okay, on a totally different note, you can tell I'm a fan of chia pudding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think what's really important is rethinking side dishes. So side dishes are really challenging in type one. Potatoes, rice, bread, high carb stuff. It's hard to carb count for it. It changes your blood sugar really quickly. So I try to pull, again, I'm always thinking about how can I pull variables out or swap variables with things that I can cope with. And so one of the ways that we do that is I try to fill half my plate with vegetables at dinner, which is a, a nice visual landmark. Like if I'm doing that, I'm more likely to stay in range. And we have this huge salad bowl, salad bowl at home, like the size of a football player's head. And I just try to fill up on salad as much as possible. And one of the things that surprised me is you can make your own salad dressing at home pretty quickly and easily. And uh, I'm actually going to write a column about that. But most, a lot of salad dressings are filled with sugar. And so they still will spike your blood sugar up. And you're like, wait a second, I'm eating vegetables. That's supposed to be great for me. 
So you can make your own uh, salad dressings at home, and I find that really helpful. Another one is just rethinking bread. So bread is another one that I tried to make work for a really long time, and I just couldn't figure it out. And so now when I order a burger, I just tell them not to serve me the bun, or I'll get a lettuce bun, or I'll do these things called low-carb, high-fiber tortillas. So they're 80% fiber, so they have very little impact on blood sugar. It's it's this little package right here, which are sold at most stores. You can get them online. And we make fajitas with it. We make sandwiches with it. So another really helpful thing. Noodles are another one that people really miss. So we make noodles with zucchini. Or I found these things recently called kelp noodles, which sounds really strange. But actually, you soak them in water, and you cook them in a stir fry. They taste just like pasta. No carbs in them. Very easy to do. Rice, another one that people miss. Trader Joe's actually sells cauliflower and broccoli that's been riced, which you, you basically throw in a blender, it rices it. When you blend it, it makes this kind of rice consistency, and then you can saute it, you can make a really helpful, uh, just use it as a helpful substitute for rice. Again, very few carbs, very little impact. How do I eat waffles? I make them with almond flour. So almond flour and eggs, you can make waffles. I've made pizza before. We make all, you can make bread with almond flour. And almond flour you can get pretty much anywhere. And we have a single serving dash mini waffle maker that's really helpful. And so whenever I'm craving waffles or something, uh, I will just make it with almond flour. And then for people that say, okay, but what about eating out? Eating out is really difficult. How do you manage eating out? This is a meal I got at Disneyland. So if I can find a way to eat at Disneyland, I feel like anything is possible. <laughs> but the key with eating out is it's easier to have willpower when you order than when the food is in front of you. So the key time to focus on is when you order. So I'll say, oh, the chicken comes with rice, I'll take vegetables instead of rice. And so you, or, you, you manage that process up front, so then you've, a, you've steered yourself away from having a diabetes landmine moment once the food is in front of you. Same is true for bread. So when they try to bring that heaping pile of delicious bread over that I'm only going to have like a tiny nibble and then like four nibbles later, and then I'm like, well, I've already eaten five nibbles, so I guess I can have the whole piece. And then you're a 280, and it's really frustrating. And so managing it up front by saying, please don't bring the bread. I, I actually, I don't need the bread, don't bring it, and then you've avoided that annoying moment later. Nuts and seeds are something I snack on a lot, so I'll often uh, snack on nuts and seeds during the day instead of eating like a really big lunch, and I find that to be really helpful. And then dessert is something people miss a lot too. And so I, I think what's cool is when you start eating this way, you actually crave less sugar and less dessert once you get over that kind of two-week transition period. Uh, but I eat a lot of berries. Berries are awesome because they're low in sugar and high in fiber, so they don't have a big impact on blood sugar. And then for chocolate lovers, I actually order this dark chocolate powder online, and I just mix it with hot water, and it makes this like delicious, rich, hot cocoa drink that doesn't have any sugar. So there's lots of tips and tricks and weird things like this, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll just cover one, two diabetes landmines that I think in the food chapter that I think are really important. One is what I call the hypoglycemia binge. Has anyone ever had a hypoglycemia binge? Yeah, so you're low, for people who have not had one, let me explain it. You're low. It's a, it seems like when you're low, it's a really great idea to go into the kitchen and open the fridge and see what there is to see. <laughs> so you go to check out the fridge. So this is a picture of my CGM. And I, my roommate at the time worked at Google. And so Googlers get a lot of free stuff, including free giant football player sized bowls of granola. And so that was sitting in our fridge at, you know, you can see I went to the fridge at 2 AM. And I swear to you, I only had a little bit of granola. <laughs> I only had a little bit, I promise you. And you can see, I went from, you know, 42 to waking up at 265, and then my morning was ruined. I was tired, I was frustrated, I was cranky. I probably didn't want to exercise, and then I probably took way too much insulin and then ended up low and roller coastered the rest of the day. So when I talk about diabetes landmines, it's those mistakes that you make that explode, this being a good example. And the key is, if you can identify what those things are, you can build a plan of attack to avoid them in the future. So if I know I'm gonna overeat, now I just have an automatic treatment for lows. If I'm low, I have glucose tabs. The point of treating a low is not to reward yourself with a bunch of junk food. 
guess what that does? It encourages you to have bad habits because you're rewarding yourself for something you want to avoid. And so I am the kind of person that finds it real. I actually am not very good with moderation. So I find it really helpful to have clear lines in the sand. So when I'm low, I have tabs. What's also helpful is to know exactly how much of something you need to eat to get back to target. So I know one tab raises me 20 points. So if I'm at 60, I need two tabs. If I'm at 60 and dropping, I probably need three. If I'm at you know, 70, I might not just need one tab. And knowing that formula is really helpful for yourself because then you can actually dose hypoglycemia corrections just like you would dose insulin, which makes a big difference. For people on CGM, it's really important to know that CGM lags in hypoglycemia so if you're low with on CGM and you treat, and then you're still low for like 20 minutes, don't eat more because the CGM will take some time to recover. So if you are low and you, and you're, you treat, and then you're still low, check with a finger stick before you keep eating on CGM. You can see, I probably wasn't low for an hour when I was in this scenario. Um, so that's really helpful. Another reason why tabs are helpful is because they work fast. So when you're low, you want to recover fast because the point of recovering from a low is just to get out of the uncomfortable state that you're in. And so tabs work really well for that. People use Smarties, all kinds of other stuff, but I, I find those helpful. Okay, one last thing from the food chapter is timing is so important in type 1 diabetes in terms of when you take your insulin, when you're eating, but there's, another, there's tons of other timing things that matter a lot too. One is when do you eat dinner? And so this is, you can see, in this case, I ate a huge, I hadn't barely eaten all day. I ate a huge low-carb dinner. And by that, I mean I made the Caesar salad dressing at home. I had a ton of romaine, which has no carbs, and I had some chicken. But I had like three plates of this because I was really, really hungry. And I went from 90 to 250 over the course of the night just because I ate way too much late at night. And of course, my basal rates aren't adjusted for keeping me in range when I eat a massive late night dinner when that's not my typical routine. So having an early dinner and not snacking afterwards is pretty helpful. Or if you repeatedly eat a late dinner, then plan for that and have your basal profile to reflect that. So that's just some of the food stuff. I, I like focusing on the food because I feel like people can get immediate impact with just some small tips and tricks that are really helpful, but I'll cover some of the mindset stuff real quickly. This goes to what I was talking about at the beginning of the talk, which was manage your diabetes or you'll have long-term complications. And I think that's helpful for a small fraction of people who are very future focused, uh, who have their frontal lobes fully developed. <laughs> but that certainly wasn't me at 12. So, one of the things that I think CGM is helpful for is why does taking care of my diabetes, my health, exercising, why does it benefit me today? Or even better, why does it benefit me right now? And I am an awful human being when I, my blood sugar is out of range. I'm tired, I'm frustrated, I'm grumpy, I'm snappy, I'm short-tempered. I suck, I'm really lame. So I don't wanna go through life that way. And I think what's really motivating is not so much what you think about yourself, but the impact of you and your blood sugar on the people around you. And so when I'm having a tough diabetes day or I'm really frustrated or I just don't want to do the effort to exercise or whatever, I try to think about the benefit that it will have on the people I love around me. And that is so motivating. And I think we can all use that a little bit more as a motivator because it's easy to just deprioritize your own health or to not focus on it because there's so much happening in life. But often when I do that, it negatively affects the people around me. And related to that is often the people around you won't tell you if your diabetes is, if you're short tempered and your diabetes is really frustrating them. So I give some tips in the book about talking to people around you about your diabetes, but one of my favorite quotes is, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. And that is so often true in diabetes because we forget to talk to the people around us about how our diabetes is impacting them in, and talking in not, if you're a parent, talking in non-judgmental ways. Uh, and speaking of that, you know, we've all had those moments where the blood sugar goes high and you're just so frustrated curse words, feeling like a failure, telling yourself that you're so bad at this. 
And I like to tell people, I was just telling someone outside, I frame blood glucose numbers a little bit differently. So as a parent, someone was showing me their child CGM last night and they were embarrassed that the numbers were all over the place. And I was like, the numbers are data. They are not judgments on your parenting ability, on your ability to manage your own diabetes. It's like a speedometer for someone's diabetes. So if I was a pilot flying a plane and the plane was going too fast or the plane was going a little off course, would I look at the instrument panel and say, I am the worst pilot in the world. I'm terrible. No, you would look at the instrument panel and you would change the way the plane is flying, right? That's what we should do in diabetes. We should look at the glucose data and we should say, I need to change something about what I'm doing. I need to learn something from this so I can avoid that in, in the future. And so thinking of this speedometer, for me, is really helpful because when I see the 252, I remember it's just a number. It's just a number. And we need to pull out the baggage and judgment and shame and blame, and I think we'll all be a lot better off. My friend Jeff Hitchcock, who runs Children with Diabetes, says the only bad blood sugar is the one you don't know. Awesome. I also never use the word test. Test implies a grade. And so if the number is out of range, you've gotten a bad grade. And that just reinforces and re-encourage not taking more tests, even though we know more finger sticks are helpful for staying in range. So I say check or finger stick or what's my glucose, that kind of thing. The reason this is critical in type 1 is because of this. When we're diagnosed, we're told food, insulin, exercise, that's what affects your blood sugar. That is not true. I've done some work in diatribe where I just tried to list, because I read the diabetes research every day, this is a partial list of things that affect your glucose in any given moment. So 22 of them. And what's crazy is some of these are absolutely impossible to know if they're in play at that moment. And these things all interact in complicated ways. So what happens if I haven't slept enough, I have caffeine, my infusion sets on its third day, my insulin vial is on day 32 and might have been in the car for a little bit. <laughs> right? So. This is why it's really important not to attach judgment and blame and shame to the numbers. Because look at how complicated this is. What human being can keep track of this? It's ridiculous. So give yourself a pat on the back. You have a very challenging condition. All of us are living with a super hard condition and the tools are not nearly good enough for us to be perfect. One tiny thing that helps me a lot, I fill out something every morning called the five minute journal. And it's like 20 bucks and it lasts about six months, I think. And it's, I found it to be a really helpful, Nicole Johnson, who I know talked earlier, talks a lot about gratitude. And this is an awesome, helpful thing because it basically says you fill it out in the morning and you fill it out in the night. It takes five minutes per day. And you say, what are three things you're grateful for this morning? What would make today great? What are some of my daily affirmations, which I like kind of blow off that section, but it's fine. <laughs> and then at the end of the day, this is critical. Three amazing things that happened today, bright spots, and how could I have made today better? Very objective, action-oriented thinking. And so I find this to be really helpful. The other thing is I just try to take five minutes in the morning and breathe. So mindfulness, meditation, all that stuff. But I think even five minutes makes a difference. So for people who are like, yeah, meditation's great, but I don't have 40 minutes a day to do it, I think five minutes is really helpful. And um, I, I'll talk about the five minute rule in, in a little bit for exercise. But this speaks to some of the questions that we ask ourselves. Why is diabetes so unfair? How is this blood sugar possible? I've done everything right, I swear. How could I be so lame and forget to do that again? Why did I eat that? I'm such a dummy. What will my doctor, husband, son, whoever say about this? So we've all asked these questions. I certainly ask them all the time. And I think one of the most helpful mindset strategies in diabetes is to reframe situations. So out of range blood sugar, what can I learn from this? What is one thing going well, even if it's small? Wow, I'm, re I'm actually really glad that I have insulin today. 
Because there are people in the world, like in Rwanda, who die every day because they do not have access to insulin. That is actually something that's really going well in my diabetes that I'm pretty thankful for. What can I do differently tomorrow? I'm a big believer in running experiments and seeing if something, if something is working or something is not working. Like, what can I change or learn from it? What am I grateful for? That goes back to the five-minute journal. Who are role models or, or resources that can actually help me? Who has gone through what I'm going through? And there's tons of people who have that can improve things. So that's uh, some of my favorites from the mindset chapter, and there's a bunch more. Mindset's actually my favorite chapter because I think it underlies everything in diabetes, especially in type 1 diabetes, and it, it drives all of the food, it drives exercise, it drives sleep. Um, but you got to put food first in a book about diabetes. <laughs> um, okay, exercise. People don't think of walking as exercise. We live in a culture where if you're not doing the insanity workout, you're not trying. And I actually, I was talking about dosing glucose tabs for lows. I dose walking for highs. So when my blood sugar is high, my immediate thought is to go for a walk. We have a treadmill desk in our office, which is awesome, because I will just sit, I will just hang out on the treadmill desk after lunch, and that's what my blood sugar does. It is so predictable how effective walking is. I think it, draw, it tends to drop me about one point a minute, and if I have insulin on board, or I'm walking uphill, it could be two points a minute, which means I can go from you know, 200 to in target pretty quickly which I think is extremely impressive. And then I don't have all of the annoyance of insulin, figuring out how much to take, not getting it right, that kind of thing. So I, I actually use walking quite a lot. And then how many have ever said this? I don't have an hour today, so I can't exercise. I've definitely said that. So this to me is one of the most powerful mindset strategies in the book. Five minutes beats zero. So when I say, well, I don't have an hour, so I can't exercise, that means I'm going for zero. So can I beat zero? Yeah, I can do five minutes. Even the busiest people in the world find time to exercise, so I never have an excuse. I can always do five minutes, even if it's just five minutes of jumping jacks. Because when it comes to exercise, I think consistency and routine beats quality a lot of the time. So I'd rather do 10 minutes every day of the week than one hour on Sunday because that consistency and that routine is what keeps my blood sugar in range. That's what keeps me happy. That's what keeps me optimistic and positive. Uh, okay, and then on the sleep front. So I'm just going to be really clear about this. Getting seven hours of sleep has a really awesome positive impact on blood sugar. And when, you don't, when I don't get seven hours of sleep, here's a good example of what that looks like. So... This was last February. I was doing an event actually in Chicago for JDRF, and they wanted me to do a live radio interview, which terrified me because I've never done anything on radio, and you call in, and it was a little bit awkward, and I didn't know what I was doing. And because it was on Chicago time in the morning at 7 a.m., it was like at 4 a.m. on the Pacific time, or 5 a.m. So I got up really early, and I'd gone to bed late the night before. I like to say I'm a night owl that aspires to be a morning person, which is a really great way to not get enough sleep. So you can see, I started that morning at 90, and I went to 187 in 30 minutes from not enough sleep, caffeine from green tea, mind you, not from coffee, and stress. So this is one, why breakfast is so critical for eating low carb, because if I had put a normal oatmeal breakfast on top of that, I would have been at 300 for sure. And two, this is why all those factors I was talking about that play into every blood sugar. And so I just happened to look at my CGM and know like, wow, this is a really great example of the insanity that is type 1 diabetes. But getting enough sleep would have made the biggest difference here. So when you don't get enough sleep, all of your hormones change, you, you're more hungry, you make worse food decisions, you crave more sugar, you're more insulin resistant. Everything, like, it's the perfect storm for having a challenging day of blood sugar. So seven hours or more, most people need at least seven hours. There's like a tiny, tiny fraction of the population that doesn't need seven hours that can get by on less, but that's probably not you or me. <laughs> so getting, getting, most people need seven to nine, and I think it makes a really big difference, and people have never been told that sleep has an impact on their next day blood sugars. So that's one to keep in mind. And I'll just leave you with this quote. This is the quote that starts the book, and I think it summarizes the concept of bright spots really nicely. 
the price of light is less than the cost of darkness. We spend so much time in diabetes on the mistakes and the things we're doing wrong and the darkness and the frustration. What is going well that I can repeat tomorrow? Where is there some light that I can expand in my diabetes? So think about bright spots. I had to show a dog picture too. Um, I thought about adding one of the other bright spots in the exercise chapter is adopt a dog. Super helpful for kids if you want to get a dog. Tell your parents it'll help your diabetes. <laughs> Promise you that's true. Um, and I just want to say thank you for having me. Thank you for being here on a Saturday. And if you have questions, you can email me. My email is brightspots at diatribe.org or adam at diatribe.org or really any permutation you can think of. Uh, and please sign up for Diatribe. It's free. We're a nonprofit, and we just want to help people with diabetes. So thank you for having me. I'll be around. <laughs> <laughs>